Oh. Well, um, I guess I'll just... There we go. Yeah, there we go. Oh. this has become my life. In my last video, I showed off magnetic brakes I built for Connects Roller Coaster. This was a hobby project turned into an academic project, and I learned a ton from it. I'm happy to say that the brakes still work great, even as a year has gone on. Okay, add it to the list. For that project, I decided to develop my own track. The reason for that is designing parts around Connect's track was going to be challenging. So I decided making new track would be easier. Plus, that way I can design the track around my needs. But if I was going to go through the process of making my own track, I figured I would make it better. So I made it stronger while needing fewer supports and it costs less to procure than the Connect's track. Also, there's less maintenance for me. So today, we'll be discussing how I design and manufacture the track, as well as giving some tips and tricks for you if you want to try it yourself. Since I released my last video, I developed the track design more and created a process for its design. I've developed a better way to manufacture the track and finish the layout for my mini coaster. It took seven months of work and I'm super excited to show it off. But before we talk about my track design, let's take a moment to compare it to the Kinex track. The main advantage of my track is that it's far more rigid than Kinex track. Those kits use hand-built track using flexible rails bent into place. These rails are connected together with rigid cross ties that are joined together with a flexible rod. These kits make building coasters easy, but the design of the track is just way too flexible. Having a flexible track design means that you need to spend more time and more parts building a support structure. To be clear, you do want your roller coaster to shift a little bit. That's okay, even the real roller coasters do that. Over time, builders have gotten clever with different ways to stiffen and strengthen the track. This is typically done by using extra cross ties and using different methods to build the structure. But this doesn't change the fact that it's still a flexible rail snapped onto a structure without physically locking it in place. These parts are still free to move and shift around on each other. I find it necessary to go through every once in a while and adjust the cross ties to keep the track straight. This is the maintenance I was referring to earlier. I suppose I could just glue the rails together? It would work really well for the first coaster. Now as for cost. You can buy a Scream and Surfing kit online for about $60 to $70, but it doesn't change the fact that these kits and the track style aren't made anymore. And to build with it, you have to cut the rails to length, meaning at some point, your track's going to be really expensive and you've ruined all your track just by using it. Okay, so now that we've talked about the Connect track a little bit, let's talk about my track. A section of my track is composed of several printed parts. The first is a large spine to give the track strength and rigidity. The spine is also where I mount extra mechanics like brakes and drive tires. The second and third parts are two rail cores. Each section has two rail cores, a right and a left. These cores are connected to the spine using cross ties placed throughout the section of track. These are all the 3D printed parts, but the rails also have an outer sleeve that is not 3D printed. It's a section of quarter inch tubing that is slid over the rail cores. We'll get to why that is later. By using printed parts, I create a track that is far more rigid. Check out this video of me letting the train roll down the hill in reverse. If we slow the video down, then you can see the track does shake a little bit, but it doesn't bend. Shaking is a good thing, and even the largest steel coasters shake and sway a little bit. That's just the track and the structure absorbing the forces. This is a tight turn taken after a two and a half foot drop. Scaling up the full size is about an 80 foot drop into a tight right turn. 
The track and the trains are experiencing a fair bit of G's in that turn and both handle it flawlessly, especially the super small printed parts on the train. It makes its turn and goes on until it reaches the brakes. My track, being that it's built with readily available materials, only uses a couple cents worth of PLA, a couple cents worth of water tubing from the home improvement store, and a couple cents worth of electricity to run the printer. The most expensive part of the entire track section is my time to design it, which depending on the part can either be 30 minutes or about two hours. Now that you've been introduced to this track, let me tell you how it's designed and manufactured, starting with the design process. The first and main tool I use to create this track is a 3D CAD software called SOLIDWORKS. SOLIDWORKS is a fairly common tool used by engineers for mechanical drawings, 3D models, and simulations. My designs all start in an assembly. This allows me to virtually assemble the coaster to see how parts fit together. This also lets me easily design parts around each other. I've got a set of connects parts that I can use to start the assembly. I build these in the computer exactly how I build them on the actual coaster. They serve as my supports and foundations, so having accurate files is important. The connects files I have are okay, but not perfect. This fact actually led me to creating the track for my braking project. To work around these inaccuracies, I build in loose tolerances where connects parts meet printed parts. I oversize all the mounts where printed parts meet connects to overcome slight printing errors and my connects models not being perfect. By having a loose tolerance, I can give myself some wiggle room in case my parts don't line up exactly. Within my assembly, I start a 3D sketch to build my track along. A 3D sketch is exactly what it sounds like. You're using the various drawing tools within SOLIDWORKS, but you add a third dimension onto it to create more complex and crash-provoking geometry. There's a couple different methods and techniques you may have heard of for designing track. The most recognizable is heart lining, where the radius of the track curvature is designed around an imaginary line above the rails. This line runs through the center of the rider's chest. Using this method will have the track and the train rotate around the rider rather than the rider rotate around the track. This method allows for a more comfortable ride experience. I'm not doing any of that and that's because I'm lazy. I will eventually, but the sections I'm designing right now don't actually have any forces on the rails beside the weight of the train. All I'm printing is a brake run, station, and lift tilt. The method I'm using has me designing the spine and rails with reference to this sketch that follows down the center of the spine. I start each section of the track with the spine, which is fairly simple. It's just a square profile extruded down the length of the section. I typically try to keep sections of the track no longer than 8 inches long. That way I can easily fit multiple sections onto the print bed and have them print all at once. To join them together, I design a mounting spot for this printed connector that screws into the spine. With the spine design, I then design the rail course. I have a template file that I copy and rename with the proper section name. The template file is a circular sketch with reference sketches to help me line it up. I move it into place using the reference sketch, then begin to design the core. For straight sections, it's fairly simple. Extrude the circle in the line and it's good to go. For curved sections, it's a little more complicated. What I do is actually create another 3D sketch in the part file to create a swept extrusion to it. Or in other words, SOLIDWORKS extrudes the shape along the curve. That works for most sections, but it's not perfect. These two sections are about as complicated as I expect my designs to get. To get a smooth shape like this will require using some other tools in the software, such as a lofted sweep. Really, it just takes some practice to learn. I cap off the ends of the rail course by adding a notch to either end that allows the track section to interlock with its neighboring section. The final step is to add the cross ties. I use a single model for all of them that I add in the place within the assembly. They are placed where I need them, and I generally try not to go more than an inch and a half without a cross tie. 
SOLIDWORKS has the ability to use one part to carve out another, so I tell it to carve out the sections of both the spines and the rail cores to fit the cross ties. I then print a slightly smaller model and they simply pop into place. The final part of the design is to add any notches and holes for track mechanics. Finally, everything is ready to go. The cores and the spines are converted to .stl files and I switch from SOLIDWORKS to a slicer software. Manufacturing the track starts at the slicer software. I use two FDM style printers and as such I try to optimize the parts to be as strong as possible while using as little support material. I do this by having the printer build the length of the model in the X and Y axis. Doing this allows for the part to be built with continuous beads of plastic rather than smaller broken up beads. The weakest part of a 3D print is where the layers are joined together. I also try to avoid building curvature in the z-axis. Building any curvature in the z-axis is like building a circle by stacking Legos. For small parts, the circle is not very circular or clean. As the part gets larger, the circle improves. But we can't just make the parts larger, so I try to set the parts in the slicer to avoid building more curvature in the z-axis than necessary. This gives me the cleanest and smoothest prints. But this doesn't work for every part. For instance, the rail cores need to be round to create a smooth riding surface, but given their size, it's really challenging to print them cleanly while maintaining their strength, especially for complicated track bends. I could try to shift the cores to print the curvature in the Z direction, but this would sacrifice their strength. Also, they wouldn't be able to be successfully printed. Little side note, Tall and skinny things are super challenging to print, as the printer just tends to knock them over. So this takes us back to the reason I print rail cores and not rails. The cores come off the printer and are unsuitable to be used as rails due to the quality of the print. By inserting them into the tubing, I create a rail that is super smooth, strong, and the correct shape. I made the spine of the track have a square cross section because, frankly, straight lines are the easiest to print. Generally speaking, the spines are the cleanest parts off the printer and require little to no adjustments. But that's not always the case. These parts here were printed with supports, and as such, they have this ugly surface. You might think, hey, what if you sanded it down? It might look a little nicer. But these are printed in PLA, and you really can't sand PLA. In fact, I find the more you sand it, the worse it looks. So we're just going to have to deal with it. In an ideal world, I would have all the parts for the sections be printed together. Printing parts together saves me a lot of setup time. But I actually print each section with different settings. Even though it's all the same material for the parts, I typically print the cores faster with a higher infill and temperature than the spines because I'm less concerned about print quality. As for the cross ties, they're just printed with normal PLA settings. Once everything is printed, I'll assemble it. I start by doing a test fit to make sure everything goes together well. Usually, this will require some fine tuning with a knife to get everything to fit. When that's done, I'll glue the cross ties to the spine. When the glue dries, I prepare two sections of tubing. It comes in a large coil and has a natural bend to it. This bend can warp the rail course if you're not careful. I find that warming the tubing up before sliding it over the cores removes the bend and also makes it much easier to get around the core geometry. Just make sure not to heat it up too much or you'll damage the rail cores. The rails will have holes cut in the tubing where they join to the cross tie. I'll do this by just going around and cutting a little hole in them. I like to cut a little extra around the connection point just to give a little more space for the glue to bond to everything. The next step is by far the most important if you're replicating this at home. We need to set the track gauge and finally glue the parts together. To help maintain the track gauge until the glue dries, I've printed several gauge blocks that are all the exact size I need. I place them around the cross ties and use clamps to hold it all together. These clamps are meant for woodworking and the woodworkers seem to hate them. But I found they're actually pretty great for roller coaster building. Finally, 
I checked the gauge with calipers and glued all together. The glue I'm using is just a simple super glue and I find it works well. You just need to give it about a day to dry. My final piece of advice for those trying this at home is to use quality plastic. A lot of frustration can be avoided by using a quality plastic. This cheap inland PLA from Micro Center is garbage and isn't even worth printing a garbage can to throw it away in. Spend a couple extra bucks and buy better quality film. Alright, we now know how to design and manufacture this track. Let's finish the layout for this coaster. Last fall, I built a magnetic braking system for it. When I finished that, I decided to also print the station and lift hill. But why exactly those sections? The reason is twofold. One, these sections will have the most train mechanics attached to it. Beyond brakes, it will also have drive tires, hall effect sensors, and a lift chain. Two, I think these sections will be a good step towards printing a full coaster while not being as huge of a commitment. I can fully refine my manufacturing design process before I spend a lot of time and money to create a fully 3D printed coaster. Much of this process has been a learning experience. Turns out 3D printing coasters is a very complicated process. The brake project ended here and the station began with a 90 degree turn to the left. That 90 degree turn was the first slight challenge to figure out. The front car of my train can make this turn without a problem. The challenge is adding additional cars to it. If the turn is too tight, the cars will touch and lock the train in place. Doing some geometry, I've calculated these trains can take a very minimum 3.5 inch radius turn. Any tighter of a turn and the cars will touch. With that in mind, I had to figure out a way to design it so all the cars can pass through. For this section, I used two smaller curves of a larger radius that allows the train to pass through without a problem. From there, the rest of the station is straight track. It was supposed to be simple, but this is where I start having issues with track gauge and sections being too wide. I spent most of April 2023 refining my manufacturing process with the gauge blocks before I was able to successfully print all parts for the station. The station won't have any magnets like the brake run, but it will have plenty of drive tires. I honestly don't know exactly how many I'll need, so I designed it to hold as many as I possibly can fit. For the brake run, I have Hall Effect sensors to communicate the train's position with the Arduino, and they work fantastic. I plan on continuing to use them, but this time I'm including mounting points for them and holes to route wires through rather than hot gluing them in place. The station block ends here, and this is where the lift block begins. The pre-lift has been something else that has really challenged me. I've already decided where the lift will start and how tall it'll be. This gave me a small space to fit in a left turn at the base of the hill. Initially, I tried a quarter circle section like this piece here that leads into the base of the lift hill here. This piece has two drive tires and space to fit a gear and a chain through, but neither piece work. Both turns are too tight. The cars touch and lock the train. So, to fix this, I elongated the curve and made these parts. I won't go in depth of how exactly I made them because they are really complicated. I had to manually edit the points of the spline to turn slightly right before making the left turn. Doing so allows the train to pass through smoothly. Each piece took nearly two hours to make. This section is about as big as I possibly can make on my printers. I could have split it into two parts, but I didn't want to create more parts for me to have to design. With that turn in place, I started to climb up the lift. I elongated the curve upwards, which allows the trains to make the turn up without the cars contacting each other. I added a large notch to eventually add a gear and chain, and included small holes along the section to mount a chain trough to. The lift hill itself is just two sections repeated. 
but it was by far the most complicated part of the coaster. I created three printed supports to go with the Kinex tower at the end. They have a one and a half inch diameter and took about six hours to print each section. Unfortunately, the floor isn't super level and that caused some shaking on the structure. Shimming the base of the supports fixes and the structure is sturdy and rigid. The supports are mostly glued together and the largest, the A-frame, is nearly two and a half feet long. Finally, the top of the lift was ready to put in place. The crest of the lift also has a large notch for a gear to fit into. This leads into a left turn towards the drop. Initially, I 3D printed track sections from the top of the lift to the drop. That's what these cursed things are. But I didn't learn from my previous mistake and it's too tight for multiple cars. Rather than completely redesign those sections, I opted just to use the Kinex track with a wider turn. And just like that, nine months of work has come to a satisfying conclusion. Let's be completely clear about something. This project was a lot of work. I'm talking about two hours a day after I come home from a nine to five job. This is not an easy or recommended project for anyone who is new to 3D printing. But I would be lying if I said I wasn't satisfied with the outcome. I love how much cleaner the printed lift hill looks in comparison to some of my early attempts at a Kinex hill. This project has perfectly served its purpose of helping me learn how to 3D print roller coaster track. In the immediate future, I'm planning on adding the final mechanics, electronics, then finishing the coaster. I need to have it done by the end of the year, so keep tuned for more videos on it. Beyond that, I hope to develop the track a little bit more. First, I plan on doing some tests to see how much force they can handle and to try to get an estimated life of the track sections. Also, I want to develop the track design to optimize for better printing times. My goals for this track design was to be a drop and replacement for Scream and Serpent track. It wouldn't need as many supports, preserve my Kinex track, require less adjustment, and would be cheaper to manufacture. With those goals in mind, I believe this project was a huge success. Except for that last thing if you factor in 9 months of my time. Someday, I want this track design to become a full model coaster itself. 3D printed and connects hybrids are cool, but this is where I want my projects to head towards. It's going to take some time to get to that point, so stay tuned for more model coasters. Thank you very much for watching. guys want to get your hands on a set of my trains. I really appreciate that and I want to make it happen. But I'm working on making them even better. So just wait a little bit longer.